Hello, I'm Marion Snyder, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. Each year, state, federal, and tribal fishery managers gather to plan the recreational and commercial salmon fisheries. It's that time of year again, and anyone with an interest in this natural resource is invited to take part. We set our salmon seasons through a process called North of Falcon, and it's a series of public meetings and meetings amongst the state and the tribes and the, the federal government to figure out how many salmon are available for harvest and how we can maximize our opportunities. It's very important for fishermen, anglers, or commercial fishers that care about what their seasons are going to be to try to participate in these meetings. The meetings are not always at convenient times and locations, but you really have to try to get to these meetings and, and add your input or hook up with a group that would be there to represent you. Uh, some groups that represent recreational anglers or Puget Sound anglers, uh, some of the commercial uh, groups are the Puget Sound Vessel Owners Association. Whatever venue or type of fishing you do, you want to find a group that can represent you and give your point of view on an issue if you're not there to help us make tough decisions on how to use our what little salmon we have to harvest. If you've never been to a North of Falcon process before or any of the meetings, you might want to plan on coming the first year and just uh, sitting there listening to what's happening and trying to learn what the processes are. It's a very intimidating process for folks that haven't participated. There's a lot of computer models that are used. There's a lot of jargon and lingo that we use as biologists and managers. And just understanding uh, the process could easily take a person two or three times going through just to feel, get a feel for it and to feel that they're being effective and making a good contribution. So you, if you come to the first one, you, you might want to just sit back and, and listen more than talk. And then the, the second year, you're a little better prepared to come in and really offer some, some good suggestions and, and help us make these tough decisions. Sometimes uh, individual folks will feel like we don't really listen to them or that they're not able to effectively make a difference in how the seasons turn out and, and that's absolutely not true. Just a few years ago we had a wonderful uh, suggestion from some folks up in the Skagit to, to try to create a Skagit Spring Chinook fishery and fortunately we've been able to work that out and for the last two years now we've had a Skagit Spring Chinook fishery that we didn't have before these folks from the public came forward and, and pushed us into getting them that fishery. So the North of Falcon process gets going hot and heavy in March. The two most important meetings are at the end of March and the first of April. But if you're really concerned about what kind of seasons we're going to have in the upcoming year, get out of the boat, get off the river, and get to these meetings and participate and help us make these really difficult decisions. Starting with Native American cultures depicting salmon in various forms of art, remains part of our Northwest heritage. Recently, an art gallery in Olympia devoted most of its wall space to local artists who had something to say about salmon. After being here 17 years, dealing with the public at large, I found a great reverence for salmon in the area. I grew up in Hood River and there was salmon everywhere and my dad was always catching it and it was always, instead of hamburger, we had salmon every night for dinner back then. But up here, I discovered such a different mentality towards it. Like I said, the real reverence, the celebration, the joy in it, the concern for preservation. And I started thinking, why not do a theme show on salmon? And so that's how we ended up with over 20 artists doing it in clay or Northwest Native Coast on aluminum, whimsy. I'm married to a fisherman. I grew up in a fishing family. My dad had a charter boat out of Westport. Um, my husband goes fishing almost every weekend and the painting I did is of fishermen in a river fishing and it's very cold and calm like a northwest river is in the wintertime. Every weekend him and his friends call each other to see where the fish are and then every Sunday they call to lie about who caught what. If you've ever deal with salmon as much as I have, you know, they become an integral part. 
of, of, of you and they become an integral part of your art because, I don't know, they're just a wondrous animal. You know, I think of, of the salmon uh, and its cycle and stuff, and then I try to determine how I could best represent that story or that particular, uh, and then I do it as a natural, in a natural form or in a stylized form. I work with a wood, carving in wood and stone. I do silver and gold jewelry and I also do print. There is an elemental coreness to it that, that is vital to our culture. Here are suggestions for fishing adventures in the coming weeks. A very innovative fish and wildlife maintenance mechanic is the winner of the 2007 Innovation in State Government Award. Jody Taylor knew there was a more efficient way to feed elk and he found the better mousetrap. It was a high labor, uh, it took a minimum of two people. We switched to the big bales and as we was feeding them we thought there had to be a better way so we came up with this feeder to lessen the labor and do it with one person. Well, we use a tractor with a set of forks on the front and we spear these big bells that uh, weigh anywhere from 12 to 1,400 pounds. We load them. It's a one-man operation loading them. Uh, then we drive out into the feedlot, cut the strings, and we control the flakes and the size from inside the cab and we do all the feeding from inside the cab. We're a remote location and it saves somebody from driving up here, uh, mileage the hour driving up here to feed. It gives us more flexible feeding times where we can feed earlier and with a lot less manpower and, and dollars. We feed from inside the cab. Nobody has to ride on the truck. Uh, with loose loads, shifting loads, no chance of anybody falling off. When it's blowing and 10 degrees out, uh, the hay shaft going down your shirt, I just figured there had to be another way, better way of doing this. With this feeder here on this feed lot, uh, it'll save us about 10 to 13,000 a feeding season here. Really, by switching to the, the large bales, um, the, the three by four foot bales, um, we, we believe that we've helped to reduce the risk of disease transmission. Um, I think in the video you'll be able to see that the animals circle around that large flake of hay, um, so their hind ends are, are pointed out, um, and I think that they actually <clears throat> end up uh, doing less fighting uh, because they all kind of have their noses in and, and their butt ends out and I haven't seen near as much of the fighting going on so we do have injuries that occur because of that um, and then again reducing the risk of, of disease transmission. We believe with the with the larger flakes that, that it is a more efficient use by the elk uh, that we have less wastage, less hay left on the ground uh, which reduces our, our feeding costs, the amount of hay that we have to buy. We started feeding elk uh, back in the late 60s on a regular basis. Um, elk fences had been put in to keep the animals from going down uh, into the agricultural lands uh, where we've got hay fields and, and orchards. 
we have a law in the state of Washington that says that if uh, our animals are damaging private property, crop land, uh, that they w the landowner can be compensated for that. So it became an issue of, of trying to keep the elk from getting down onto those uh, crop lands. And because of that, and because those are our best winter range uh, grounds, it became necessary to feed the animals to get them through the winter. There are plenty of wildlife viewing opportunities in Washington this time of year. Here are just a few. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching.